Hoffman. We're going to kind of pick up and conclude what we were talking about last time uh, since I looked at the clock and it was time to quit and I was only halfway through what we wanted to talk about, which is part of the case. But uh, Ephesians chapter number 5, if you will, this morning, verse 18, uh, we'll just kind of go back in and look at the what's really what Paul's really talking about here in the in the issue here in verse 18 when he says, "And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit." And we spent some time looking, actually months, looking at the issue of what it is to be filled with the Spirit. What it, when Paul talks about that, he's talking about having your life filled, controlled, gripped by the Spirit. And the love and the grace of God as it's designed to work in your life. Colossians chapter 2, the sister verse to this, or Colossians 3, I'm sorry, the sister verse to this, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, Colossians 3.16. And that's the issue, where you let the word of God come and work in your inner man, and as that begins to work, he then begins to grip your life, control your life, and he begins to take your life and to then go use it for his purpose, for his will, and what he would have you to be in the church, the body of Christ. And he does that, but he does it through the working and the instrumentality of the Holy Spirit. That's why when you get saved, it's so critical that you understand Ephesians 1 verse 13, that you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And he's the guarantee. He's the, the uh, earnest, the down payment that what the Lord said he's going to do, guess what? He's going to do. And that's tremendously. But then what is Paul talking about when he says, wherein be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess? And again, we begin to look at that. He's not talking about going out on Friday night or Saturday night or having a beer at the ball game and getting drunk. Common sense tells you what? Don't go get drunk, okay? But rather, Paul is beginning to, he, he's honing in on an issue that you and I, we, most, most of the time we never talk about. And most of the time we never understand. And I want to take today, finish up what we talked last time, and then go over and spend some time looking at what Paul's dealing with here. Because when you begin to get into what Paul is after, if you come back with me, and again, this is kind of review from last week. If you look back with me at chapter 1 and verse number 10, Paul begins to give us, and, and, and again, Ephesians doctrine, we're not studying the book of Ephesians, but Ephesians doctrine is advanced information. Romans to Galatians, we lay the foundation. Okay? And Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, we're now beginning to build an infrastructure here. And we're beginning to build information. That, that's why, if you, you're in chapter 1, I told you, right? Look at chapter 2. <laughs> Look at verse 8 and 9. Verses we know. He says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Do you see how in two verses he just gave you five chapters of Romans? And he did it in two verses. If you look back up at verse 4 there, 2-4, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. You see how he just sums up real quickly? What, we, what takes Romans 1 to 8, really, to understand. Because Ephesians is going to be built on that foundation of Romans, Gal Corinthians, and Galatians. So as he moves us into Ephesians 1, he begin, he's talking about, in, in Romans, he's talking about you, the individual. And in Ephesians, you're in Ephesians 1 now, right? You, of course you are. Look at verse 1. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. You see the saints? In Ephesians, he's going to talk to the local assembly. Here's the lo Now, the local assembly is made up of individuals. So individually, if we have our lives filled with the Spirit, Romans 5, or, sorry, chapter 5, verse 18. Then in verse 19, 20, and 21 of Ephesians 5, he says, here you are individually. Here's what it's to look like in your life. You have that harmony, and you've got that thankfulness, you've got that servant's heart. But then in your life, if you decide to take on roles of husband and wife, and then you decide to have 
children, here's what those roles are going to look like in a spirit-filled life. But that's individually. But then individually, what do we do? We come together in the local assembly, and guess what? In the local assembly, it's going to look the same way. There's an issue here that you're going to have to understand that in Ephesians, he's talking to the group, He's talking to the individual, and then he's talking to the local church in the group. You know, it's just all these people. Because the Word of God's designed to impact you and your life on every level. That's where it's going to work. That's where it's going to hit. And in chapter 1, verse 10, actually in chapter 1, verse 3, we learn that we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Where? In Christ, in everything that we're going to learn about in our walk, in, our, in, in, in everything in all of our life, in our conduct, in our, in our or, uh, calling, in our wealth, in our walk, in our doctrine, in our duty, is it's all in Christ. So he says in verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather to one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven in which are on earth, even in him. And he lays out the, hey, verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. His will is no longer a mystery. It's been revealed. What's his mis- what is the revealed will of the Father now? Verse 10, he's going to do something in Christ. And Paul begins to introduce to us this, this thing that's going on, the system that's going on behind the, the scene, if you will. Okay? Uh, have you ever thought about the internet? Have you ever wondered how that thing works? It was just there. Now I know what's his name says he invented it, but that's what's his name. Oh, what was his name? Al Gore. Al Gore thank you. I'm like t- drew a blank. You know, he said he invented. But you know, the thing of it is, is what it, there's a whole system behind. Would you Google? You know, or Amazon. And what Paul's going to introduce to us, if you look in chapter 2, is he's going to introduce to us now, verse 2, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. And he's going to begin to introduce to us that, yes, this is who we are in Christ. Yes, this is what we're learning. Yes, this is how we are. But don't get too far, don't get too high-minded, because there's somebody out there that doesn't like what God's doing. And that's the adversary. And he's got a course. And he's got this thing going on. And he uses the term here in chapter 518, Be ye not drunk with wine, wherein is what? Excess. And that issue of being not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, doesn't have to do about going out and have a red rosé or a sangria or whatever else you guys like to drink. Okay? It, you know, me personally, I'm water and tea <laughs> right now. You know, but see, the thing is, he's not talking about that. He's rather, he's talking about something that's going on behind. And he uses that word excess. And you know, your flesh, when, when you're in excess, you're feeding the flesh. That's what you're doing. Look, look back in chapter 4 in verse 17. And, and you know what? We're not to do that. We're not to be drunk with wine wherein is excess. We're not to be feeding the flesh. We're to be operating in who we are in Christ. Verse 17, he says, I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye. Now, who's the ye? The group, the plurality here. Well, first, it's the church at Ephesus. That's who he's talking to, right? Then he's going to talk to the faithful in Christ Jesus. And then he's talking to you and I the church, the body of Christ. And, he's, and the only reason why Paul has to say this is because this is happening. You know that. He doesn't say, hey, let him be accursed, you know, don't do this, don't, unless some, it's going on. And what's beginning to happen at Ephesus? What's beginning to happen? What happens in your life? Well, you're going to do this verse, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. They're thinking, Vanity, emptiness. Don't walk like the Gentile. Don't live like the unsaved. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with 
greediness. That verse 19 is a classic definition of excess. You're working all uncleanliness with what? Greediness. Greed. Give me more. You know, religion, Christendom out there says that gain is godliness. Yeah, you notice I spun that, right? Because what do we learn? Godliness with contentment is great gain. What's religion say? Uh uh-uh, uh, baby, get it while you can. He with the most toys when he dies, guess what? Still dies. But the bumper sticker says wins. No, when you die, you're not taking any of it with you. You got your mind. And you know what happens to most of us? Every now and then we get in a little flesh snit where we've got to have our way and we've got to do this and we've got to do that. And then we just, by the way, let me just say, having things is not wrong. 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says uh, he, he's given us all things to freely enjoy. So it's not talking about not, he's not against having things. You just, how you're thinking about that. Have that be what control, the excess is what he's after. Because what happens is it begins to take over. And it begins to be what feeds. You know, God hates sin. We understand that. But he hates it because it robs you of life in Christ Jesus. He hates it because it robs you of the good things he has prepared for them that love him. It, ro- it takes away from you. It causes you to not be able to think properly. And the wine, five, eight, go back over to chapter 5, verse 18. The wine, the sin, it's all because he's getting at this issue of, hey, there's something going on behind the scene Come back to Genesis 6. Let's just look at it. We were actually... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go to Genesis 6. Let's just do it. He's talking about the chaos and the violence that comes in. Now, it's going to come in for a reason. And when he talks here about be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, he's talking about something that's behind the scenes that's design is to come in and to move you away from who you are in Christ. The adversary, you're sealed with the spirit of promise, Holy Spirit of promise. The adversary knows he can never get you out of Christ. But he can cause you to to do what? 417, go walk like the Gentiles walk. He can cause you to be moved from and into something that you're, you should not be in. If you look here in Genesis 6, you have Noah, the days of Noah, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Look at that. Where did man get to? Actually, actually where has man gotten to even today? That verse right there, it's evil, what, continually. The way you think, your ima- the thoughts and the imaginations, the thoughts, the truth, the facts, here's where they are, here's reality. But imaginations come along and say, let's paint this puffy little beautiful picture of what it could be like. And, and you get off in the artsy and the dreams and the, what, and you know what, that's not real. What's real? Right here. This is an imagination. And he says, you know what? You know where man is? Man has allowed imagination. Notice imaginations are listed first, the imagination of the thoughts. Man is not living in reality here. Rather, they're over here evil evil continually. Verse 6, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. What, what's going on? It grieved God, the, the condition of man. He, he, he has, God made Adam and Eve, set them in the garden, told them to be fruitful and multiply and have family and do all of this and replenish, and get it going. And they were doing that until sin entered into the picture. And what did sin do? Sin robbed Adam and Eve of the benefits of who they were in Christ. 
But it, then it also robbed mankind of that, Seth, and the image of Adam, and all. And you just go through all of that, and it grieved God because of what was happening in the earth. That's what verse 6 and 7 is talking about. He looked at man, and it grieved him. All of the earth had been corrupted. Notice that in verse 7. Man and beast and creeping thing and fowls, all of creation has been corrupted. Isn't that interesting? It's not a, well, the butterflies are not corrupted. No, the butterflies are corrupted. That's what the verse says. It's all of it. Verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Why is there violence in the earth here in Genesis 6? Because what did man, what's in his heart, verse 5, only evil continually. You see, the chaos of sin had produced a total, it had totally messed up the world, threw a wrench in it. And in response to that, in response to the whole world being corrupted, what did God do? He flooded it, didn't he? He judged it. He kept Noah and his three boys and families. Come over to chapter 10 of Genesis. In response to the violence, in response to the chaos, note, look at what God did, 10.1. What did he do? Genesis 10, verse 1. Now, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem and Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. Uh, that's not the verse. I, I need 9-1. I'm sorry. I'm like, that didn't get worse. 9-1. <laughs> Noah comes off. What did God do? 9-1. Noah comes off the earth. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Sa similar to uh, Adam, but not completely the same. Do you notice what's missing from Adam's decree? The issue of subduing it. Because things have changed now in the earth. You go read Genesis 1 over there and he looks at Adam and he says, Hey, I want you to be fruitful and multiply and replenish and subdue it. Here there's no subduing. Now he's going to introduce something in response to the whole world being corrupted. He judges it and then he introduces the issue of human government. National government. And he says, Hey, Here's what we're going to do. At uh, Noah, verse 2, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. <laughs> now you got to go hunting. Now you got to go, you know, we, they were talking about salmon. You know, pre-fall, salmon would just jump right up and, you know, love on you and kiss on you and go right back in the water. Pre-fall. After the fall, you know what you got to do to salmon now? You got to go fishing. You got to throw the hook in there. And you know what they're doing? Not today, turkey, we were up at Yellowstone. The guys are out there tr trout fishing and the fly fishing in there. And I'm sitting there watching them. And I don't think any of them caught anything. You know, I really don't. But they say they do, but I don't believe them. You know, you know how a fisherman's story is, right? I caught him. He was really that big. You know, <laughs> he really was that. You know, you can zoom in close enough on any fish that it looks bigger than you. You know, you really can. Photoshop. Now, what's, now you got to go hunt, got to go get it. Verse 6, And whosoever sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed for the image of God made he. Now we got capital punishment. Now we've got human government introduced. Now chapter 10, verse 1. you got Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Verse 2, And the sons of Japheth, and you get this whole list here. If you drop down to verse 5, by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue and after their families in their nations. What's he doing? He's establishing nationalism. He's scattering out. He, what did he just tell Noah, chapter 9? Scatter, boys. If you've got to go hunting, you know what you've got to go figure out? Where the game are. You got to move with them. You, you're going to be. You're not going to stay in one place. You're going to move around. And and the design of that was to fill up the earth. 
If you look there at verse 20, these are the sons of Ham after their families, after their tongues and their countries and in their nations. Verse 31, these are the sons of Shem after their family, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. What is he doing? He's causing man to go out here and divide up and get into borders and families and tongues and lands. Borders, language and culture, that's the big buzzwords you hear. And you begin to, and you begin to set up boundaries and boundaries begin to get set. Government gets established. It's all in response to the chaos, the evil, the sin. You follow what's going on? That's what's being set up. Uh, folks, uh, come over to Romans 13. Romans 13. When you think, back up and think about some of what's going on here and what Paul is trying to get you and I to understand is that when God created creation, he set up some, rule, some boundaries and some rules and some guidelines. And what you're reading about with Noah and all of this that's going on there is him establishing the four institutions of creation. The first one's volition. The second one is marriage. The third one is family. The church, the state never set that up. God set it up in creation. Then he says, I'm going to protect those. Society, the basic building blocks of society is volition, family, uh, marriage, and family. What was filled with the Spirit in Ephesians 5? Volition, marriage, and family. The basic building components of society, of culture. Then he says, i got to protect that because what did man do? Messed it all up. What was happening in Genesis 6? The angelic creation was leaving their first estate, Jude says, and visiting the daughters of men. It was a mess. And God said, I'm going to fix this and I'm going to set up nationalism. And that's the fourth institution. And nationalism, human government, is designed to protect volition, marriage, and family. And you look around today, and I told you this last week, if you look at history... Okay, we're to learn from history, so we don't do what? Repeat it. Problem is, is when you rewrite history, guess what you're going to repeat? Not the rewritten history, the original history. You know why you know that? Ecclesiastes, Solomon says there's nothing new under the sun. You're just going to repeat it. And you can have all the well-meaning and all the want to change things and to make things better until you fix the sin problem, the hard issue with man. Kind. You'll never fix any of that. You're just going to repeat it. In Romans 13, Paul gets, verse 1, Paul is going to talk about the institution of national government here. And he says some interesting things here. 13.1, let every, what? Soul. That instantly tells you this is an inner man issue. Well, I don't want the government telling me nothing. You know what? Then you got a problem with your inner man. Because let every what? Soul be subject. That's an inner man issue. That's a coming. When, by the way, if you bow your back at mandates and all that stuff, that isn't the problem with you. you got something going on inside of you that you haven't come to terms with. Now, I'm not saying they're right or they're wrong. Okay. I don't like anybody telling me what I got to do. Listen, if they tell you you got to do something, then they're going to come through those front doors and tell us we have to do something here that we don't agree with. Okay? I can remember years ago when the first anti-smoking ban was on the ballot in Mesa. No smoking in public buildings. I voted against it. I said, no, they ought to be able to smoke. Smoke wherever you want. And boy, I got flack from everybody from A to Z. But you know, they never understood my reasoning. You know what my reasoning was? Because one day they're going to come and tell me I can't read my Bible. And where they got their grip was in a no... Now, smoking's stupid. You want to smell like you've been to hell? Go ahead. But that's just... Physically, it's just a mess. But what are they going to use? Because we do that, now we can tell you you can't read your and study your Bible. And oh, by the way, you can no longer do it publicly. Oh, by the way, today the Bible is being considered as hate language, lit language, literature. Where did that start? It started over here with something everybody, you know, anti-smoking. I'm against you not smoking. 
but the government began to reach. You follow that? So you bow your back. There's something going on inside of you. Let every soul be subject unto higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. When he talks about powers, he's talking about government. Not the people in the government. By the way, the people in the government, what are they? Sinners. What are they? Who do they need? Christ. Think, have you ever thought about how a, have a government that was Christ people in charge? What it would ever look like? You do in Scripture. It's called the kingdom. When the little flock sits and reigns and rules and do, you know, but you'll never find that on earth until the Lord returns and sets it all right. Okay? And by the way, you and I will be in heavenly places. We'll just be enjoying watching it, you know. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth, and here's what I'm after, the what? The ordinance of God. A lot of times that gets said, you're resisting God. It doesn't say that. It says resisting the what? The ordinance. The mechanism that God had established to maintain something, to control something, to slow down. And that's in verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. You see that issue of the evil? The evil. There is a specific evil that God had established government to stop, to control. And that's, that evil is the violence and the chaos, the product of man's sinful heart. And what, go, what government was established to, to remedy and to slow down was that issue of the chaos and the violence that man's sinful heart can produce. The evil there isn't the robber or the murderer. The evil is that chaos that that produced. So government was planned, was ordained, if you will, the ordinance, to stop the chaos, the violence. You see, that, again, God wants, he hates sin because what does sin do? What does it accomplish? It stops you from enjoying the good things he has for you. We looked at that last time in Proverbs. And you know what he wants you and I to be filled with? The Spirit. He wants us to be filled with the good things. So government, the whole system in Scripture, that's the design of it. Now, I know man has taken it and run with it, and you got your different types of government and Paul's not talking about types. He's talking about the system. And the structure that God has placed in the earth, we need to understand that. And we need to understand it because when you look at our country, everybody falls to pieces, whether you're on one side of the aisle or the other side of the aisle. But as a Bible believer, we don't need to be on an aisle or this or that. We need to understand what's happening. We need to understand what's going on because we have a job as the ambassador for Christ. You follow me? Okay. We have a job here. We have something. Uh, ho, ho, look, over, look over at Ephesians 3. Oh, just, this is so fantastic. It's just can't even get it out fast enough. If you look at Ephesians 3, look at verse 9, and we're going to spend some time here in Ephesians 3 over the coming weeks. Because when you begin to understand the system and what and how God created it, and, and the structure that God placed in the earth um, for mankind, for man to, to be able to, to go out and be fruitful and multiply and to do, and this issue of nationalism, boy, it'll make a dif difference in your life when you think about what's going on out in our culture today. Look at... Ephesians 3, look at verse 9. Verse 8, unto me, that's Paul, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's Paul's motto as the apostle of the Gentiles, is verse 8. By the way, it's not verse 9. Okay? Verse 8 is Paul, the apostle. 
Verse 9 is you and I, the ambassador. And, and by the way, Paul in Ephesians 6 says he's what? An ambassador for Christ. Okay, so Paul's going to say the same thing. But everybody goes, oh boy, 8, 9, and 10, Paul's motto. No, Paul's doing something. We'll talk about that. Again, it, this is so good, it's hard not to say, get it out there. Verse 10, verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that, what's that next word? Now, right now. As ambassadors for cry, of Christ, what are we to do in verse 9? To make all men see what is the fellowship of this mystery. We'll talk about that. And, verse 10, to do something else as well. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. You see, there's a wisdom plan out there that's counter to the wisdom of God. And you know what we're to do? We're to shine a big old floodlight on that bad boy and expose it. How do we expose it? By manifestation of the wisdom of God. By doing what we're supposed to be doing, shines a big old light out there of, hey, there's another program. It's called the lie program, Romans 1.25. It's called the satanic policy of evil. And Satan's got an I will plan. And you know what he does? He comes along and he seduces man. And he uses verses. Anyway, we'll look at all that. Go, go back with me. To, you see, that's why this is important. Because we have a job. By the way, in 310 there, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places, that's that angelic realm up there. You have elect angels, saved angels, and you have fallen angels. That would be unsaved angels. And you know what they're doing? We'll talk about it. They're watching us right now in this room. Now, you don't have a guardian angel. You've got the Holy Spirit. I'll take the Holy Spirit any day than a guardian angel. <laughs> Sorry. CEO to bellhop. I'll take the CEO. Thank you very much. But you know what they're doing? They're watching because we're, what are we going to do? We're going to manifest something. We're going to teach them. They're going to see something. And you know what? Satan don't like it. He wants you to live in the chaos. Come back with me to Deuteronomy 32. So we need to understand some of this. I believe. I think we do. I look around. I read blogs and I read people's writings and stuff. And, and I see the, you know, I look there and I go, you know, I don't want us to be so confused that we think A is whatever and B is... I want us to know what Scripture says. And Scripture says that there's an ordinance of God, there's a system that God has put in creation. And its design is to protect man. Its design is to, is to thwart, it's to stop, it's to slow down the violence, the chaos, the evil that sin produces. And we're a part of it. We're a part of that plan. And we need to understand that. Look at Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32, at the end here of Deuteronomy, it's called the Song of Moses. As Moses sings a song here about the future history and the future trouble coming to Israel. And he says here, verse 7, 32, 7. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father and he will show thee. Thy elders and they will tell thee. Man, when God established the nations in Genesis 10, okay, he says, verse 7, you need to pay attention to the knowledge passed on by the elders, the older generation. That's what he's saying in 7. He says, hey, Remember the days of old. Remember your fathers. Go talk to the older folks. In our culture today, you know what we do with the older folks? We dismiss them. If you believe the mess in New York, you go kill them. If that stuff's actually true, I don't know. Well, that's what happened, right? That's, so they say. What do you do with them? You sit them down and you say, hey, how was it back then? 
What, how did you, I tell you what, my wife's grandmother, she was 95 or 6 when she died. She lived, she was born in 1890-something, okay? I sat with her as she was in the uh, nursing home. And I asked her, Grandma, what was it like moving from candle to electricity? She said, oh, it was the best thing ever. I said, okay. And she, I mean, two weeks, that's all we talked about was, well, we used to have to make the candles and do this. And now we just went over and flipped a switch. Now, the house burnt down twice before they got it right. But you know what? It was the greatest, you know, and all this, I'm like, holy cow, you know. And then I asked her, I said, what was it like going from from horse and buggy to car? Because she did that. We have postcards of her from the 1913 World's Fair. Got, you know, Chicago World's Fair, New York, all this stuff. All over the world she traveled. You know how she did it? Paid her ticket, got on the boat, and went across the pond. No TSA. No, no. And I asked her about that. How was that? And she'd just go into detail. And then I asked her, how was the Great Depression? Because when we cleaned out her home, we found hordes and hordes of aluminum foil rolled up. And, you know, those take-home, just stacks of them. And I'm like, what in the world? And I got to talking to her, and she began to talk about the Roaring Twenties and how she was a flapper girl and all this stuff. And then the, mark, then the bottom drop. And, all, and you know what? I begin to understand it. You know what? That's what's coming our way. That's what's happening our time. And it began to change some of the perspective Verse 7, in the national anthem to Israel, you know what Moses says? Don't put the old people in the home. Talk to them. Learn from them. Isn't that That's fascinating to me. Look at verse 8. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance. Boy, wait till we talk about that. The Most High, defined in Genesis as the possessor, God, the possessor of heaven and earth. He divides to the nations. When the Gentile nations out there told God, take a hike, Tower of Babel, Genesis 10, Genesis 11, you know what God did? God took the gods, the little g, and he assigned them to each nation. Didn't know that, did you? We'll look at it. You see, things just didn't happen. There's a, there's a reason behind it. God he did what? He, set the, he divided the nations. What did we read in Genesis 10? Borders and families and language and culture. When he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. He dressed them out there. Think about that. The number of Israel. What is the number of Israel? 12, that number of governmental perfection. Do you know when Israel shows up the first time in Scripture? Genesis 12, with Abraham and the seed of Abraham. Oh, whoa. Now, ultimately, there are Israel, but that's where they get their founding. Verse 9, for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Notice how the operating of the world, how is it to be done? It's according to how God said it to be. What did he, he set this here, he gave them that, he set there, he gave them that. And then he steps back, Genesis 12, and says, okay, Gentiles, you're on your own. The curse of Genesis 11, scatter them out there, get them in their families, languages. Could you imagine running into somebody that speaks Russian, and you don't speak Russian? And then you run into somebody that speaks what you speak, and you go, what are you going to do? Here, come here. (laughs) Hold on to you. Right? And the guy that speaks Russian, he sees someone, he holds on to them. And what happens is he causes man to do what they failed to do under the edict given to Noah. Come over to Acts 17. You guys with me? So this, I look at this stuff. I've studied this stuff out for the last, for years, just pieces. And I go, man, this is so critical because it's critical in how you function today in the world. Because, folks, we live in it. We're not of it. We belong to him. 
and our identities and everything. But man, you can't you can't get away from going to Bashes to buy a loaf of bread I'm, or a Walmart or wherever you go. And guess who you're going to run into? You run into the world. So you might as well understand it. Look with me here, in Acts 17. Watch Paul do this. Paul's a it's fascinating what Paul does. Uh, Acts 17, uh, verse 22. He's on Mars Hill, right? Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Woo! Nailing them. Verse 24. Watch what Paul... Well, verse 23. For as I passed by and behold your devotions, I found to the altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. When Paul tells Timothy to give attendance to reading, there's more to that than just reading God's word. It's more in line of being well read. Paul understood how to deal with the step with the uh, Stoics and Epicureans to get them out. He understood these guys. He'd read their material. And he says, you got an unknown God over there, idol. Let's talk about him. Verse 23, 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all, watch, life and breath and all things. Watch how Paul just ran you back to Genesis. He just took you back to creation. And, verse 26, hath made of one blood all nations of men. For to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. There's Genesis 10 when he set it all up. By the way, we're what? One blood. Never forget that. You got a big thing going on today in Christendom and in the pulpits around the world, around the nation about race and all that stuff. And you know what? That is not the case in Scripture. That's all made up by a political agenda. I'm just sorry. That's where it comes from. I'm not saying things are right or wrong, but just understand its origin. Now watch verse 27. That. Why did he do that? Why did he set the bounds up, Genesis 10? Why did he put this group there and that group there and this group there? Why did he do that? That, the purpose, the intent. They should seek who? The Lord. He set them in smaller units for them to do what? Have an opportunity to find him. Have an opportunity to seek him if happily they may feel after him and find him. Why would they have to feel after him? Do you remember what we read back there in, in Genesis? They're what? They're blind. Their hearts are blinded. They're in sin. They're in darkness. Have you ever been in a dark basement with the lights get turned out on you and you're not familiar with it? I have. You live in Chicago long enough. Somebody usually turns the lights out on you in the basement. The next thing you know, you've bumped into that rail like three times. And what are you doing? You're What's, what's lost going to do? They're going to do, but what, are they, what do they have the opportunity to do now? Find him. Verse 27, though he be not far from every one of us. The boundaries, the order, is designed to produce, to accomplish the plan and the purpose of God. What is the will of God? He would have all men be what? saved, and come to the knowledge of the truth. Salvation's first. So what does he do? He sets up the opportunity. Now come over to Revelation 17. We're just skimming the treetops this morning. In Genesis 11, a young man shows up. His name was Nimrod. And Nimrod was a usurper. He's the one that caused the Tower of Babel, the city of Babel, to be built. He caused the one language. God told Noah, scatter, and his family, scatter, you go hunt. Nimrod was a mighty hunter. 
He said, don't worry about that. We'll go hunt for you. And actually, you know what we'll do? We'll hunt it. We'll kill it. We'll process it. We'll have it for sale down at the grocery store. You don't have to do anything. Just kick back and enjoy. And as society gets created and the arts are created and, and all the different things in culture and leisure time. You know there was no leisure time in the original creation. Do you know how long man was working? He's working six days. And the seventh day was the Sabbath day. And that really wasn't, I mean, I know everybody says you don't work on Sabbath day. But ultimately, that was for them to stop and think about what they had just, what, why they're working six days, what creation was all about. <laughs> and man created leisure. And Nimrod says, that's okay, you need, your, you need your leisure time. I'll take care of it for you. A direct disobedience to what the Word of God had said. So they built a tower, didn't they? Think about Genesis 11. They built a city. A city is a political unit. You remember the first city man ever made? Cain did it. What did God tell Cain to do? You're going to be a vagabond. You're going to be a wanderer. Cain said, no, I'm not. And he built a city, named it after his boy. Heritage. My legacy is established. Because my city is my boy. Well, what did God do to Cain? <laughs> Messed with him. A tower. A tower is a religious center. In Psalms, Israel is said of Israel that the Lord is our tower. It's a religious center. And again, with Nimrod, it's all to rebel against God's word. So the beginning in Scripture, of what's called Baal worship, starts with an organized religious system designed to carry people away from God's Word and what He's doing. Okay? They do it through government decree, and they do it through religious decree. You got Revelation 17. In Revelation 17, here is the culmination of what is known as Baal worship. In Deuteronomy 32, we didn't read it. He says, their rock, little r, is not as our rock, capital R. You know who the capital R rock is, right? Paul says in Corinthians, it's Christ. Baal worship in Scripture starts with... with Cain, really, okay? And it's going to work its way down through Scripture, and it's going to culminate right here in Revelation 17. Now, when you come out of Scripture and you look at history, we'll see it here in just a minute. History has this Baal worship system personified through history at different times. Revelation 17, 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now, he's going to talk about this great whore, this beast. And this is the beast, and she's riding the Antichrist. And when he talks about this great whore here, this beast here, he's talking about the religious system of the Antichrist. He's talking about Satan's church. He's talking about the system that Nimrod helped promote and do, but it starts with the fall in, in Genesis 3. And he says, verse 2, "...with whom the kings of this earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made..." Now watch, "...drunk with the wine of her fornication." Notice that. They've been drunk with what? Wine of her fornication. Now, this is about spiritual stuff here, okay? This isn't about getting the hooch and, you know, give me another 40-40 or whatever and the brown bag in it and off we go. He's, and this is what Paul's after right here. The intoxication, the, the description here. They're... Verse 4, 
I'm sorry, verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Look at her description. Here's a description of the system, of the religion. What is she? She's got purple. She's scarlet colored. She sits with a golden chalice in her hands. She's arrayed in gold and precious stones and pearls. and have, She's what? She's beautiful, isn't she? She's attractive. Verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery. Now notice the comma. Babylon the Great, comma. Her name is Mystery Babylon the Great. That's her title. But what is she? The mother of harlots and abomination of the earth. Notice, notice her title. Who is she? She's the mother of what? Of harlots. She's the mother church. She's the mother church with all other kinds of churches springing out of her. She's the mother church. She's the mothership. She's the center. She's the whole religious system that's designed to produce all of the different kinds of denominations, of groups. She sits as the foundation, as the base of it. Her color is purple, scarlet. Her symbols are a golden cup. By the way, the golden cup is filled with the wine of her fornication. That's spiritual stuff. Over in Psalms, we'll see when we get into this, they come in there and, and, and the, the Antichrist causes her, he sits there in the, in the temple and his claims to be God. They bring the, the overcomer in, the believer in, and they literally slice their throat. They behead them and they take that golden cup and they stick it under them and they have a drink offering of blood, Psalms calls it. Now, are you supposed to be drinking blood? No. Blood's the life, but what is she doing? She's drinking that blood. This isn't the blood of the grape. This is the blood of the saints. And you know what? When Paul says, don't be drunk with wine, he's talking about this system. That's what he's talking about. Come over with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. She's going to get them. It's the system. Look at 1 Corinthians 10. Just bear with me. We'll wrap this up and we'll get into some other things here next time. 1 Corinthians 10. Watch Paul bring this up, verse 16. 10, 16. Man, when people talk about the Lord's Supper and all this stuff, they fail to read 1 Corinthians 10, which sets up 1 Corinthians 11, by the way. 1 Corinthians 10, look at verse 16. The cup of blessing which ye bless is, is not the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which ye break, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Well, what, what, what great questions. So there's a cup here, isn't there? There's a cup. Verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of who? Devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Notice how Paul brings in, and you know what he says? Don't be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with what? The Spirit. Paul in Ephesians is making a reference to understanding this system. In Scripture it's called Baal worship. And its design is to come all the way across Come with me to Jeremiah 44. You, we, we'll skip Deuteronomy for just now, but just run over to Jeremiah with me. Jeremiah 44. It's going to come across there. And when it comes across there, it has its, 
It raises its ugly head today. By the way, in Revelation 17, 5 there, the first title of hers is mystery. It's interesting in 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul will say the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Now there's a reason why she's called mystery. And I'll tell you real quick, that's because she's going to pull a little trick. She, Satan, is going to pull something on Eve, and he's going to do it and say, God has a secret that he doesn't want you to know about. But if you join me, I've got the decoder ring, and I'll tell you the secret. So she develops a mystery. It's also a mystery because it's the course of the world. It's running behind the scenes. And what the average person out there doesn't catch is that. That they're really the children of disobedience. And they're working after the course of the world and they have no clue about it. You and I need to know. Uh, Jeremiah 44, you got it? Give me five minutes. Well, maybe. Look at verse 15. Jeremiah uh, 44. He's going to, he, uh, if you look at verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews which dwell in the land of Egypt. So he's talking to Jews, and they're down in Egypt, and they're running. They're, Nebuchadnezzar has come in, he sees Jerusalem, and they're running. Verse 15. Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods, and all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt and Pathros, answered Jeremiah, saying, Notice the men know what? What did the men know? That the wives are out of line. What did Adam know? Eve was out of line. And you know what? They don't stop it. Adam didn't stop. They don't stop. Verse 16. As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. What's Jeremiah say? Jeremiah says, don't do this. And you know what they say? We ain't doing it. Now watch verse 17. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto, look at that, the queen of heaven. And to pour out, what? Drink offerings unto her. As we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, for when we had for when we for for then had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. But since we left off to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the You know what? We were better off over there than we are over here following your word, the word of the Lord, Jeremiah. So guess where we're going? We're going to go back. But who are we going to go back to? Notice her title. In Jeremiah, 587 B.C. was what? Queen of Heaven. Does that sound familiar? That sits out there today. Building just over down the street. Queen of Heaven. She's had her manifestations over the year. By the way, queen of heaven would, would, would entail a female deity. Baal worship's full of it. She's called Ashtaroth. Rome called her Venus and Cupid. The Greeks called her Diana. The Phoenicians called her Ashtaroth. Egypt called her Easter. Today, it's the Roman Catholic Church. What are they doing? They're giving her drink offerings. Look at verse 19. And when we had burned to the, uh, incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? A cake. That table of devils issue in 1 Corinthians 10. What does that priest do? Every Sunday or every Mass... This, is the, this cup is the blood of Christ, and abracadabra, zim, zam, boom. And this is, and you know what happens? Now you're a cannibal. And all this stuff. And you know what? It, the whole of Israel was caught up in this. They were being led away. And Jeremiah stands and says, don't do it. The Apostle Paul talking to you and I today. 
He's not talking about getting drunk on Saturday night. He's talking about don't be like the pagans. Drink offerings. We'll look into all this. Don't be, don't be like them. You are, you're to be filled with the Spirit. Boy, you're to reach to a higher level of life, a better level of understanding, a better appreciation of who you are. The vain religious system is used by the satanic policy of evil to come and to take you away from who you are in Christ, to thwart you. Folks, we live, come back there to Ephesians 5, we live in this present evil world And the only safety for us is in the social order that we live in, those values that we live in, the understanding of being filled with the Spirit. That's what's going to keep us from the chaos, from the violence. And ultimately, when you and I go and do and live as who we are in Christ, the adversary is not going to like it. So he's going to come after you. He's going to attack. And he's got mechanisms, and we're going to look at those in a, probably the first of the year. <laughs> okay? We've got, he's got stuff like that out there that he just reaches in and says, here, there. And you know what? You're in Ephesians 5. Look at chapter 6, and we'll close here. Verse 11, he says, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He says that after he's gone through about what it is to be filled with the Spirit. You have the armor, you just got to do what? Stand in it. You don't even have to put it on, it's already been put on, you just have to stand in it. You got to use it. Put on the whole armor. Put it on. Use it. It's there. Get on who you are in Christ. Because there's a whole system. And we'll start next time in chapter three. We'll show I'll show you the system all through Scripture. And you can look at history. You know why most people think Rome's the bad boy, the Roman Catholic Church? Because what does it look like? It looks like the mother, Babylon the Great the mother of harlots. But she's looked that way since day one, all through. You and I, we live in a world we live in, is in the present evil world. You've got to know what's going on behind the scenes. When you hear so-and-so say this or so-and-so say that, just know there's something else going on behind it. Paul says we're to have all knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And then he says a little word called prudence. And I, that prudence word caught my attention. Prudence is knowing the big picture. Prudence is being able to see behind what's going on. Prudence comes from maturity. Prudence says, you know what? It was better when the electricity, when we just turned the button, even though it burned the house down twice. <laughs> but now it's here. Prudence is going, going, wow, look at that. Look in there. And here's how you get it. So when Paul says, be not drunk with wine, he's talking about let's not be a part of that satanic policy of evil that's out there. Okay? All right. Thank you for your patience. We'll close here. Dear Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for the instructions that we have here in Scripture. And as we dig into them and as we look at them and as we study them, we'll see your intent, your true intent in creation, not only of the earth but also of the heavenly places and then our participation in those heavenly places. And we do this with our eyes open and our hearts wanting to know and to know you and to know what your word has to say. In your name we pray, amen. All right, again, thank you for your patience.